And good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. 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 Um, awesome. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. And to another episode of Been Streaming, I guess. Uh huh. <laughs> I guess it's, it's a Monday morning. So, uh, hi. Good morning, everybody. Awesome. Um, first question of the day: um, Is our sound okay? There's been some fidgeting yes. with the sound between us. We just want to make sure that uh, it does sound okay-ish. So we're not uh, mm. too... So that mm. Kobus is not louder than me and I'm not louder than Kobus. Kobus is always louder than you, but uh, you might is... not be happy with that. But it's fine. <laughs> That's a fair point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. This uh, bi- this is Labek. This is Labek. Uh, hi and good morning. Um, cool. So okay. welcome to Bean Streaming. Bean Streaming is our morning session every monday and every friday where my well where my uh bald brother from another mother um okay. talk That's about technology um in, a, in a very uh, loose fashion i was just telling yeah. the people what we are doing today uh, well what, okay. is, what awesome. are we doing on this show so uh, yes um, we we tend talk to pick topic, we tend to p- tend to pick topics what to talk about from time to time uh, we tend to build mm-hmm. things from time to time or even mm. sometimes we com- go completely blind and just random whatever right so but um do feel free to ask us questions in the chat we're very open to those things um this is mm-hmm. um this is a live stream so um uh, we enjoy having discussions with the audience so uh we see that we have a few people here waffles is here uh early for a for, 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 for a change right oh <laughs> welcome yeah. we do have some recurring uh members here and um the our streams are much more fun when we when we can interact with you and we can ponder mm. on your questions um instead of trying to invent things to talk about um one of the things that I, I, I want to keep doing while we're doing this, because people do know who we are, but there are some people who do not know. So let us introduce us, ourselves. Kobus, <laughs> tell people who you are. I thought are. I'm Darko. Oh, oh not I'm Darko. A, oh, I'm a Kobus today. Okay. Okay, I'm a Kobus <laughs> today. Okay, cool. Um, so my name is uh, Kobus Bernard, and I am a developer advocate based out of Cape Town, uh, all the way down in the Southern Hemisphere in South Africa. Um, my background is a lot in automation helping customers move from um, wherever they were before into AWS, uh, a lot of DevOps, automation, um, config management, wink, wink, manage, manage. And uh, actually, before I joined AWS, I was a customer for eight years. So I've been uh, building on AWS itself for quite a number of years. And then also dev total, I think going down the 15, 16, 17 years, depending on how you count things, at least. So it's one of those, like, we don't talk about it anymore, just like we don't talk about age. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of that, Kobus is older than me. And... Um... <laughs> <laughs> but uh just Nasty. because of the because of the it it age I, I've, I've been in it for like 10 years ish um a bit more um my name is darko i'm a developer advocate basically the same that koba said literally the same he said i'm just based out of uh, out of berlin germany but i'm originally from serbia uh and i've started in aws five years ago almost um started in premium support um moved on to being a solution architect and now i'm a developer advocate helping people such as yourselves who come here to look at us and maybe educate you sometimes and, and entertain or edutain as they would like to call it mm. so yeah um welcome hope you have all uh, this today is monday october 12th i uh, hope you all have it is a monday mi- it is monday mm. hope you all had a really great uh, weekend and i hope this start of the week is good now before we get into the into the beginning of the show um we need to shell something um this video is probably sponsored by the dev day coming up this <laughs> thursday uh october 15th uh-huh uh dev day no 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 no. we're sharing a generic link we're not doing dark oh no no, no. We, we're sharing. yeah okay okay Backstory: We have an internal uh, competition who can refer more people. Yes. So um, uh, currently, it's a very close tie between Kobus and myself. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, what what we are doing is um, uh, trying to get more people to it. But we have created a generic link, the one in mm-hmm. the description here, well, in the in the in the chat, right? Or, or not the chat, but um, the, the the one showing up on screen right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the one that we are be, we're going to be using um, to. If you want to yes. register for this one, use that one, uh, or go to my Twitter. No, but, no, 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 no. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. What was that? Though? Sorry, Darko. Cool. Let me pop it there in the chat as well for everyone. Yeah, please do. I actually haven't looked at the stats because we were like literally like doing this the whole time I, now. I think I think it's still now we're equal. I was looking at it this morning. Um, we're still equal, 
or actually I was leading for a while and then it <clears> kind of became oh. equal again for some reason, but it went down. So it, I think um, it's, oh, it's, our love, okay. it's our lovely platform is, 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 is weirding out. But um, mm. yeah, doesn't matter. We're all winners. <laughs> but yeah. the bigger, biggest winners are you who registered to the event. Um, oh, you're breaking uh, up a little bit darker. Let me just check. And uh, somebody in the audience just confirm if they can hear darker. I just want to see if it's my side or his side. Are you there? Darker, I think your your video is broken as well as your audio, so just double check. Yeah. Definitely something your side. It sounds like you, if you can hear me, that your line is completely saturated. So, uh, while we wait for Darko quickly to, I think, probably... Because he should be on a cable. He shouldn't be on Wi-Fi, I believe. But quickly sort out his internet woes for the moment. Um, uh, the dev day um, that is coming up is focusing on modern application development. So we'll have topics like how do you do event-driven applications in terms of the architecture. Um, I'm focusing on container cluster optimization in terms of cost and also meeting SLAs. Um, then I know Darko is talking about infrastructure as code. Um, oh, awesome. Yes, quick. Clemido, no, I'm not that sneaky, but thank you for the suggestion, Jonathan. Um, that link you actually see is, if you really are interested, you'll see that expands into this massive link thing. And right at the end, you'll see where the tracking code is, which is uh, not Kubernetes, not Docker. Um, so please make use of it. But basically, that um, the dev day that's coming up, it's um, a lot of it's, I think, 12 sessions in total. Um, let me actually bring it on the screen here, just for those that are interested. Uh, give me a second. Open that up. Uh, that's closed. Sorry, it's always fun just getting the screen share up and running. Share screen, big screen, share. There we go. Let's hide this part quickly. Um, and if I go down to the agenda over here, it might be a little bit small. Let's make it a bit bigger. There we go. You can see that what we've done is we've started looking at how to think about what the type of people are that are interested in um, attending the event. Now, like I said, it doesn't mean that you have to stick to one track only. These are all individual sessions, and we will make the recordings available afterwards as well. So you can, uh, if you've signed up for them, get the link um, as well. But you can see here things like uh, getting started with uh, CI CD for serverless apps. Um, this is quite a fun one, performance tuning cost optimization for serverless applications, which is, um, I don't, if you're not familiar with Alex Castelboni, uh, he built a Lambda power tuning and what this does is it actually takes your Lambda function and then runs it in different instance sizes. So, for example, the with um, between around 1.8 gig of RAM, it goes into a different um, backend in terms of what it's run on performance-wise. So sometimes giving it more memory gives you more performance, which means it completes quicker, which ultimately means that it's cheaper, even though the total execution function is... Um, um, uh, in terms of the, the cost you would think is more because it's a more expensive one. Um, and I'm just quickly double checking. Uh, Darko is apologizing. His internet has gone down. Um, so I'll be rambling on for the next few minutes and entertaining you while he comes back. Um, but yeah, so that, that power training, what, what it does then at the end is, is an, even as a, um, a UI now um, that um, someone helped contribute because it's an open source project that Alex is running. And it shows you the, the graphs of where the points are, where's the cheapest um, in the best, a combination of memory to use with your Lambda and run it. Uh, so super fun, that one. Um, and like I said, there's a deep dive on AWS developer tools, which should be good. Advanced infrastructure as code, which is also, um, wait, my mouse is on the wrong screen. There we go. Advanced infrastructure as code, that's one of the Arco sessions. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend. And then also what we are doing here is that we are running office hour sessions and uh, those will be per track. So we have, well, um, we're still working out exactly who's pairing up with who, but they are um, then, You've got the ability to ask questions of us in real time uh, after the event. But also, while this event is running, you can actually ask us because these are pre-recorded videos. So we'll be available during each of our sessions to answer the questions. So come join us, have fun, and uh, yeah, learn about how to build modern um, applications. So for today's session, um, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be talking about configuration management. And the reason we picked this topic is that it's something that uh, we both have a lot of experience in, but also we are now in an interesting time where things have started to change a little bit with the introduction of containers. Um, you no longer just need, um, well, let's take a step back quickly, history. Uh, you had a big server on-prem. They tended to be fairly big, um, and then you had to configure it somehow because at the end of the day, you buy hardware because you want to be able to run your applications on it. And to do that, that 
server needed to be configured. Now, initially, in some places they'll do it, you would go in and you would configure the server by hand. Sometimes you might have a document checklist that's about this long. Uh, my longest one that I'd complete was, I think, 500 or 600 individual steps. I can't remember exactly how many, but it was one of those like thick documents and you literally like go step by step by step, make sure that whatever it is you're doing works exactly the way you expect it to. And you just really hope that they didn't change the menus or some kind of config on the base operating system because otherwise you did not have a fun time. So that was the thought of, you know, there's a server you have to configure things by hand and set them up. Then what started happening is people started scripting things. So think bash scripts, PowerShell scripts, you know, make things a little bit better. The challenge with that, however, is that when you are changing them, and I think Docker might be back, um, is that, let's give him a sec. Hello. There we go. Internet bad is back. <laughs> Internet was horrible. I'm sorry. My, my, my connection completely broke. Uh, I had to restart my, my cable, mo cable modem. And uh, Ooh. Uh, it's, I'm using Vodafone in Germany, and uh, they, they're great usually, but in the last month or so, at points, I just completely just, just breaks. It, I mean, it's it's a oh, well. it's a problem on their side because the trace route just completely fails at their first hop. So, okay, yeah, cool. So what I did is I quickly spoke about um, the upcoming dev day and showed them the agenda, highlighted a couple okay. of scenes, shared my personal link to get more registrations. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, giving a quick intro history lesson on configuration management. I start off just by explaining pan installs, and we're now just quickly discussing, okay. you know, one step up creating bash, um, bash scripts and PowerShell scripts. And while that's useful, it also tends to break because the yeah. server isn't always in that nice starting state that you expect it to. And uh, that's not that pleasant. Um, but at least this, this is going fast. I mean, it's, you can okay. get your service configured up and running a little bit better and all that. Um, did you have any interim steps between using like bash scripts and things and going directly to something like Chef or Ansible or um, hmm. uh, Salt or Puppet? So I come from a Windows world, and in Windows it was Ooh. a lot different, right? And and when people talk configuration management, one of the one of the earliest forms of configuration management people get into, especially on Windows, is just group policy objects, right? The way you mm. manage configuration on, on Windows servers is by using uh, Active Directory GPOs or group policy objects, where you basically you create these policies or configuration items on uh, directly on Windows uh, and and that just configures your system. So that's kind of somehow a, a way I did approach things. So it's uh, it's not a full-blown uh, independent configuration management system, but it is definitely something much more than just running scripts. Um, it is very limited though, because you can only do the things it, it supports. <laughs> but uh, uh, but for, for, for pure Windows servers, that was usually just enough. So mm. I must say, okay. that, yeah, that was my first. And I mean, there were problems with that and um, uh, the, the, the repeatab repeatability of those things. I remember once having to migrate to a separate domain and, um, th oh yeah, I, I, at, at least back then. So this could be my ignorance or just, uh, a long time ago, it was 10 years ago. Uh, I, I had no way to copy existing group policy objects back then to a new domain controller and a new, actually to a completely new domain. So I had to basically go one by one and look what did I configure and just yeah. do those things. So, yeah. And I hope you didn't make a mistake or forget about something. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a, mm. that's a huge problem to say the least. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can imagine. Yeah. No, I, must no. say, I did, I did a bit of windows stuff with, uh, was, what is it called that came out? DS, uh, it's not DSL. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, PowerShell it's, it's, DSL. PowerShell not DSL, DSL, not DSL. Uh, the the desired state. Do you know state, what I'm talking about? Desired state. Yes. DSM, DSM. Uh, DSM. Yes, the desired state management, yes. yes. When that came out, that was actually quite a big change for Windows because that also enabled, yeah. and I know they work quite a lot with Chef on, um, on that as yeah. well, is that you finally got to the point where you can very easily use some of the more modern tools for it. Um, PowerShell, and, PowerShell came literally, actually, it's not PowerShell, DSM came literally when I stopped working with Windows. So, ah. uh, yeah, before that, besides the GPOs, there's a, there was a system center configuration management or SCCM, system, uh, oh, yes. it was a Microsoft system center configuration manager. Yes. So it's basically, it's a separate configuration management utility, uh, from just using your domain group policies. Uh, 
Is it is it DSC? Is it not DSC? Yes, it, uh, I was actually DSC? googling that for us now. It's the desired state configuration. Yeah, ah, DSC. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tadraug or Tadraug. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. No, I never played with yeah. DSC. Like I, I did mm. see that it's cool. I mean, it's a it's a coded way to manage configuration on Windows. Yeah, I'm all in, right? Um, oh yeah. But tell me, how do you do things with scripts? I really want to see how do you approach those things. I have my own theory on that, uh, and I, I have, I have, um, I have Darko configuration management um, system. Oh yeah, I built myself. Uh, it's it's wow. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I would like to hear how you did it. So initially, and I actually found them recently, and was, was cleaning up the very first AWS project I work on it worked on back in the day. Is I yeah. one of the things I had to do was internal DNS um, to be able to get between the services because there's okay. nothing like um, um, service meshes or things like that. They don't even exist at that point, really. Yeah. So I found my bash scripts that I ran in via the user data for when the instances came up, and part of that was that I actually edited the DHCP config files to point to different things and get specific IPs. And I, at one point, I was still going with a static IP root with cloud instances, which is super janky. And please do yeah. not do that nowadays anymore. Um, but yeah, it's like, that. that's how I did it. And then from there, my next step was probably, um, I think Ansible was the first real one that I played with properly. And especially even on Windows. I did quite a bit of Ansible with Windows with WinRM. Okay. For yeah. remote access, but it was that was before they fixed. There was a I can't remember if it was a bug or it was a missing feature, but you could only get like five kilobytes a second throughput when yeah. interacting with them, which made it incredibly slow. And that's kind of like where I started giving up and started playing and learning about Chef, which was a, a very interesting learning curve doing it on your own with no one else to other than the internet to learn from. So that's how I learned Chef as well. Like literally, yeah. it was just me my, my myself trying to do things. Uh, but I must say, like uh, um, or uh, DCM. Darko's configuration management, as I called it back then. Um, I didn't even call it the configuration management. I, I, I've basically, I didn't know it was, that thing was called configuration management. It was 2009. I had a, I was working in a company. We had all physical servers. Well, not all physical, uh, virtual machines, right? But all in our local data center. And 95% of them were Windows. So a lot of them were configured with things such as, um, you know, uh, group policy objects. But sometimes, if you want to make a quick change, uh, group policy objects were not ideal. So I made a little uh, application. Yeah. Well, actually, I've uh, I've created a whole bunch of PowerShell scripts, and uh, because it was all Windows, you can do Windows RM. But not even that. Windows RM or WinRM was support. Actually, not WinRM. A PowerShell remoting was supported only okay. for PowerShell 2.0. And we still mm. didn't have all the systems with PowerShell 2.0. We had Windows 2003 servers, right? So, uh, and what happened is that I had like a, I was, I was, I had like a little application. Have you ever used Auto IT? Auto IT. <laughs> so it's a, it's a. It drinks a bell, but yeah. It's a, it's a language framework uh, that basically helps, makes you, helps you write little front ends or automation utilities. They do something, right? It can click your mouse. It can uh, run a script if you click a button on it. So I made like this little Windows-based GUI application that would mm -hmm. like if you would like if I would like to um, enable updates on all Windows servers or do some kind of a, a thing immediately, I would click a button. It would run a PowerShell script to get all the domain all the servers from a specific set of OUs in a in a in a in a Active Directory, and then um, uh, get their IP addresses because. The DNS. Uh, uh, I didn't have to fix those things. Get their IP addresses, and then basically um, go through all of them and run a specific PowerShell remoting command. And if PowerShell remoting wasn't supported, it would do like WinRM. And if WinRM wasn't supported, oh, wow. then then uh, if WinRM wasn't supported, then there was this amazing tool. So if you ever uh, was a Windows admin, you know uh, uh, you know PSExec or the glorious Mark Rusinovich. Mark Krasinovich made a set of tools, amazing tools for Windows. One of them was uh, uh, PSExec. PSExec enables you to execute remote applications on a Windows server as long as you have permissions. So <laughs> if it didn't work, I had to use PSExec. So it was like a mishmash of things. Um, and especially the problem was because I had to keep the state of that somewhere. Now, state was was very loose definition. Mm. Like if I would configure something, yeah. for example, if I would have to create a specific directory on all servers. Okay, directory is simple, but if I would flip a flag on a server or something, do something specific like that, I would have to keep a track that I did that. 
especially if I do like a hundred servers at a time and I fail somewhere. So what I did is actually was writing on the, I had a specific server just to keep the state for. So I called it my scripting server. And uh, <laughs> that's where I had like a, a text file, literal text file where I would drop things in and <laughs> just keep some state. Yeah, well, but I mean, that's actually started because the, the big important thing there is like, it's like the organizer says state is important because yeah. not every command is rerunnable. Um, yeah. And you have to make sure that, you know, you're in the state that matters because otherwise you keep running commands and then things keep on breaking. Um, just a quick question here uh, from uh, Alex Sol is repos for the scripts. Um, uh, no, and mine is very explicitly no. The reason is that they are terrible. I do not want to share mine. Um, but you should be able to, I think I've got a couple of chef cookbooks on my um, uh, repo that you can access, uh, application cookbooks. Um, and we can dig a little bit into application versus, uh, what are the other ones? Cookbook. It's an application cookbook and a... Application cookbook. Is that, mm, like, old, yeah. is that like Chef 10, Chef 9? Uh, yeah, it's around there because the, the okay. thing with Chef, um, maybe we can dig into this quickly a little bit for those okay. that are interested, um, is that with Chef, there are, I think, 16 or 20 places you can set variables, depending on what level you're dealing with. Oh, okay, okay, the, okay variable. The yeah, yeah, okay, okay. The bake cook. But, but but that's this is this is part of why you have an application cookbook. Okay. Is that what you have is you've got your base cookbooks, which are installing specific things. For example, mm -hmm. I've got a cookbook for installing Java, installing yep. uh, SH users, etc. All of those things. Then what you do is you go one level up of that and you create your application cookbook for your specific application and you version that cookbook. Because that one then inside itself pins the actual environment cookbooks as well. Like I want this specific one for Java with these specific parameters and all that. And what ended up happening then is that allows you to then on a per application basis version and pin those versions on an environment level of what cookbook is. So when you want to change things, so let's say I go ahead and update my Java cookbook um, okay. with whatever changes. Then if I didn't have it pinned in an application cookbook, everybody would just upgrade. Because remember what happens is with Chef, you upload your cookbooks uh, to the central Chef server. That's what makes available. If you don't have okay. a version pin, then it'll just grab the latest one on the next run. Okay. So what this allowed you to do is to say, okay, cool. Do that kind of version pinning and then you could pin the versions and do uh, manual um, version upgrades inside the environments because let's say my one application now needs the newer version bump it in dev wait till things are stable bump it etc okay. etc because et it had to be a very controlled one the alternative obviously is just saying like let's hope everything works and it rolls out everywhere okay i mean i i know that chef has this very complex system of like the uh, uh, Parameter or attribute practice precedences, like they mm -hmm. have this big old map where it, <laughs> I know. Remember, doing oh, yeah. that was always complicated. Like, so which which attribute is going to be applied to this one? But okay, I I, I thought like application cookbooks were something chef specific, but it's just your no no, it's just a special okay. Uh, okay no no okay. no no, it's a pattern. It's a it's a, it's a very it's well a pattern. pattern. Okay, yeah, yeah, but but yeah. Um, mm. okay, okay, it's not it's not a special cookbook, like a not a special format of cookbook or anything. I, I get that. Perfect. Yeah, cool. No, I mean chef was a was the first proper configuration management mm. utility that I used and, and loved to an extent that I'm like, oh my God, this makes things so easier, right? Um, um, you did have to wrangle some Ruby. Um, but by the way, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you explain why configuration management is important or why it... Uh... No, we haven't gotten there. We just like, okay. I dived straight into why uh, how we were doing it. Okay, so for those of you who are wondering, configuration management, mm. when we talk about configuration management. Now, this this kind of is very weird to talk about in 2020, especially containers, serverless, all those things. Um, but configuration management is basically a way you configure your servers. Now, they can be mm. easy to instances, it can be on-premise instances, it can be whatever, right? But the way you configure those servers, how do you install packages? How do you manage users? How do you manage... Uh, directory structures, whatever, right? All the things you need to do on the operating system level. Now, mm. you might come to me and, or Scobus says, hey guys, uh, well, you have user data for that. Yeah, but user data is mm -hmm. is good for uh, immutable systems if you're going to be constantly yeah. spinning those instances up and down. You can burn things into, into like your AMIs, that's fine. But if you want to have a system that needs to be up or you cannot just re-roll it from time to time, um, you need to have a way to interact with your system to run commands for, for the lack of a better term uh, to install packages to do those things outside of it booting up so that's where yeah. configuration management comes in it made a lot of sense when things were data center driven where, where you would have like fixed servers you would install an os once a year and mm. and that's it uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense well actually it's it makes less sense today but there is still a valid use case 
And um, no, definitely. Yeah, not everything is serverless. Not everything is a container. Mm. So and also it helps with oh, Sorry, and help with configuration drift, which is something that yes. not everybody's familiar with. So what that means is, let's say I run my install scripts today, uh, or I ran it like three weeks ago, and I run them again today. Whatever I have today is not going to be exactly the same as I had three weeks ago because package versions have been upgraded. People have brought out new uh, dependencies. They might even have swapped things like uh, with OpenSSL and LibreSSL in terms of package dependencies. So what happens is that the two systems are no longer the same. So how do I handle that kind of drift? And that's also where config management keeps bringing it back to whatever you want it to configure to be. So that when something new comes along, let's say we switch from OpenSSL to LibreSSL, Libre mm -hmm. then that would already have been applied to the currently running servers as well. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, sometimes you really need to have such a service, such a feature mm. that, that will keep your servers running while making changes to it, right? So that's the goal yeah. behind configuration management. Now, even though it's not the most popular thing to talk about in 2020, uh, there's still a lot of use cases for that. And um, mm. it just makes your thing makes your life easier. As Kobe said, just drift management. Uh, mm. if, you, if you like, for example, if you set up a chef server to configure like you have user A, B, C, D set up on your system, Chef will ensure that you have only these users set up there, right? Uh, yeah. Well, will, will Chef do that? Yes. Well, if you can, depending on how you configure it, you can tell okay, it to yeah. listen, only you, add. Okay. Only but add. Yeah. You can also like mm -hmm. have a full management. Like you have like like an allow list or a deny list set up by Chef. Yeah. Chef will do those mm -hmm. things for you exactly in that way. And you don't have to introduce some external... Um, configuration manage magic or some some scripting things like I did. I had to basically check for everything that happens. Like for example, mm -hmm. um, this is where the thing called item potency comes in. Chef, oh, yeah. Puppet, and Ansible, when it comes to OS configurations, are item potent. That means if you configure Chef to create a directory on a system or install an application, every time the Chef runs, it will check is that mm -hmm. true or not. And if it is, it will not do anything. If it's not, it will actually execute it. So you don't have to introduce like, I had to introduce like a, a verify script that hey, is has this server have this? Does this server have this directory on it, or mm. does it, does it have this user? If not, don't do it. I have to do it myself. Um, otherwise, it will do it twice. <laughs> so that is but, where uh, Chef comes in. And also, where that becomes useful is you might have seen files that at the top have like a little comment line saying, "Please do not edit this file. Chef will change it again." And that's one of the other big benefits is that you don't have these snowflake servers anymore because as soon as someone goes in to fix something by hand, yeah. guess what? Thirty minutes or however long your chef run is set to, it yeah. comes around and says, "Okay, well, let's revert the file and fix it." Yeah, exactly. um, and also, the reporting I might say enjoyed with Chef is you could see like what, how many time, how many resources were changed with every execution. So if you put that on a dashboard, that was always great where you could see like things are flat, 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 then sudden spike. So you immediately know, okay, something just happened, what happened? And then you right. can at least go investigate. Um, my worst one there is that um, I didn't pre-install Java and we actually installed it when the instances came up. So there were scaling events all the time, servers coming up and down, everything was working fine until the one morning when all of a sudden the dashboard, there was a distinct timeline from there on, everything was red. Okay. And we're like, and, and things started failing. So obviously life was not good anymore, uh, but we have automation. So we're like, what happened? And yeah. that was when Oracle moved the Java install files behind a login wall. It wasn't a paywall, luckily, but yeah, you did have to wall, set yeah. up uh, an additional config to be able to download them all of a sudden because they want to keep track of them. So I don't know what the reason was, but uh, that was quite an interesting one to be able to see, okay, cool. Oh, something went wrong now. Yeah. yeah. And then also, yeah. yeah? I mean, but but having a system that can react in such a way, you were you were able to fix it, right? Mm. So it's not like you oh, have yeah. to re-roll your entire setup uh, because something failed, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, it's been that was that was smallish. That was like 150 or 200 servers. It's not like large, large, but it was enough yeah. to be something that I did not want to do by hand. Um, but also the other thing that I really enjoy with these type of tools is like when you do make a change, like um, at one of the places I rolled out uh, Datadog. Um, okay as a management tool. Now, the fun part there is you, on the one side, you're watching Chef over here, you click the, okay, push the cookbook and now add yeah. it to all the roles and things. And now it's going to start adding them to servers when they actually yeah. roll. And on the other side, you keep your da uh, your dashboard open. You just see like the service like pop up. It's like, oh, it's a lot of fun. But that's a, that's a great thing. Like you, these things help you like make these little building blocks or, or like masks that will convert your mm. servers into something else. So that's really great. I mean, you have mm. a collection of cookbooks, uh, or a wrapper cookbook with a bunch of other cookbooks. Oh uh, yes, I remember those. Yeah, that's a whole discussion as well. Should you use wrapper cookbooks or profiles or uh, what was it? I, that's I actually how I did it. 
I had the so I there were wrapper wrapper cookbooks. Wrapper. Yeah. yeah, wrapper cookbooks were the specific things that I was installing. And an application cookbook yeah. was normally a grouping of a bunch of wrapper cookbooks along with specific app config. So correct, correct. wrapper cookbooks, profiles, or roles. Now, Chef actually oh, yeah. encouraged you to move away from roles uh, because it's very difficult to version control roles. So it was, yes. hey, use wrapper cookbooks because you can version control mm. wrapper cookbooks. But then they came out with profiles and like, hey, you can use profiles and then profiles are something better. Uh, but that's the last time I worked with Chef, so it was with profiles. Mm. But yeah, um, mind you, it's not only Chef. We talk about Chef because we have most, most experience with Chef, but there's also a lot of tools like that out there, like mm. um, Puppet is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, Ansible, uh, Salt Stack, CF Engine. I'm wondering if there's anything else. else like, uh, yeah, I, I use CF I Engine. I use CF Engine in one of the old companies I worked in, and CF Engine is like this old, very old piece of software. I mean, very old compared to the modern, the modern days, mm. right? So yeah. <laughs> but I must say, um, of those, uh, I started off with Puppet back in 2013, 2012, I think it's the first time I played with Puppet. Mm -hmm. um, and got, got a, okay results with it, but it's like, if I remember correctly, back in that at that point in time, the, the run order wasn't, um, what do you call it, deterministic, so you knew exactly yeah. ABC was going to run. It was like, you you kind of like uh, what's it called? Thrash the server a few times, like where ramp up, ramp up, reboot, ramp up, ra reboot a couple of times, and then you you're there at some point. Puppet on the outside looks exactly the same like Chef. Like if if you look at it, like it both uses Ruby. It's a very similar approach. You ha you don't have cookbooks. Mm -hmm. You have modules and you have manifests and those things. But the major difference, and I, I've learned this because I've been working with Chef and especially working with Opsworks on AWS. And when, mm -hmm. when Opsworks introduced the support for Puppet, I've actually went to Puppet to Portland to speak with them to see how those things work and, and basically get educated by them to kind of uh, try to understand. Now, I always, always was comparing it with, with Chef, which you know wasn't fair to them, but um, there are slight differences in Puppet. How does it work? Now, number, number one benefit of Puppet is that the ability, the ease of actually um, triggering runs. Now, Chef, the Chef, both systems have an agent. Both systems have an agent running on the instance. Chef mm. calls in. Chef agent phones in to the server. Hey, this is me. Can you give me my cookbooks? And then the Chef server gives you your cookbooks. Execute what you need to execute out of your cookbooks. Now, what's going to be executed out of those cookbooks is determined by the client. On the Puppet side, it's actually the other way around. Um, the Puppet agent calls into the Puppet server, say, hi, this is me. Tell me exactly what I need to run. And then the Puppet server actually runs a compilation of all the things that server, that exact server needs to run. So basically the Puppet agent comes comes with, hey, this is my information. This is my manifest. This is who I am, my all of my details. Please determine what I need to run. And then the Puppet server determines exactly the things it needs to run, sends you a run list and like, hey, this is what you execute. Um, the problem there is that you have if you have a thousand servers constantly phoning in to the Puppet server, Puppet mm. server just collapses because it cannot keep on compiling all the things. That's why you have like additional like um, secondary masters or whatever they call it. Um, and and but the benefit of that is that you can actually phone in to the agent, so you can tell you can go through the Puppet console and say, execute, apply cookbooks, not sorry, apply manifests to all the things. So, mm -hmm. uh, unlike in Chef, you cannot do that. In Chef, you have to trigger. Uh, no, 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 you can, you can, you can, you can. You can use uh, uh, knife SSH and those things. Yes, but yes. that's 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 the other way around. So basically, knife SSH is just running an SSH command to a vast array of EC2 yes. of instances to kick it off. So to kick it off, yeah. This thing yeah. uses basically the, the communication path between between oh, the okay. pu 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 puppet uh, agent mm -hmm. and the, and the server. So that's that's the main difference. But, right? So just just one clarification on the chef side, it's not the, the the client actually does ask the server what should I run based on what the client's configuration is. Generally yeah. speaking, when you when you did configure a client, you specified with this role or with this set of yeah. cookbooks, etc. Uh, but that config is stored on the server, so the server knows. Oh yeah, well, this absolutely, absolutely yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it but, is there, but, yeah. But the, but the, but the client decides what mm. it needs to run later on, right? So uh, in, on on puppet side, it literally has to. Uh, uh, it has to basically compile to you what you're going to be running, right? So yeah. we have a question here. Um, let me pop this on the screen so I can read it better. Uh, so Tadraug or Tachdraug, uh, this question applies to containers as well as legacy deployments, but would you recommend handling config app or infrastructure, infrastructure config either 
A. Derived from an environment or execution. B. Stored in a static config file with source control. C. Use a dedicated config tool like AppConfig um, in a container or immutable world. How much would dynamically... How would you in the Mac infer at Bootstrap versus baking into the image? Okay, so I have I have a lot of thoughts on this. I, yeah. It's a great question, and I have a I I can I can I let me get my soapbox, because configuration management, especially in the modern world, is exactly what you said. It's mostly app configuration, especially on things like serverless and containers. We wanted to get into this, but I I, I have a I have a big discussion with uh, with uh, one of my colleagues who's who's very into this, and um. Mm. The, the 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 thing about um, how much would you dynamically configure your things really depends on what you're configuring, because what do you th what do you think about when you say application configuration? That's my first question to you, and I would love to hear that because mm. I would like to get feedback from people who use yeah. these things, because we're trying to make recommendations from our end. Um, yeah. So uh, let, let me tell you one thing. So when it comes to um, Application configuration. There's the obvious thing: feature toggles. Right? Hey, I yeah. am setting up a feature on my application. I'm going to enable it with this little flag. Right? Perfect. There are allow lists and deny lists. So those things are basically configuration items, which you can. They're not static. They're dynamic. They keep on changing, and your application needs to be aware of them. Uh, but also, for example. Um, I think I mentioned this before. Having a serverless application is great. It's cheap. You can have mo hundreds and thousands of, of Lambda functions running across you know, a vast array of, of things, and it will still be cheap. You know what's not cheap? Monitoring those things. This is where oh, the problem yeah. comes in. You have thousands of serverless applications, and monitoring becomes more expensive than your serverless application. So yeah. what do you do here? You do selective monitoring or selective um, logging, for example. If something happens, if there's an incident in your application, you enable logging or enable verbose logging. How do you do that? Yeah. You do it through a feature toggle or a configuration management system like this. Yeah. So how dynamic is that? How, how fast do you need to enable that? You need to enable it immediately, literally, like if something happens, right? So. This is where the question comes in, like what's more dynamic? Like, of course, static things like, oh, which Java version are we going to be using or which whatever yeah. we're we going to be using. But yeah. But but this does touch on a point which we'll dig into this, I think, a little bit more, is which is the uh complete one side of the spectrum, which is immutable infrastructure, where you cannot change a single thing unless you reprovision the entire Correct. set of infrastructure you use for it. And on the other side is everything is configurable and changeable. And there's a balance I feel between yeah. the two. I've never I've tried fully immutable and there were headaches, but this specific example is one where you need to jump in immediately and change that config. Yeah. I mean, do, doing it doing it fully immutable is very difficult because then you have to do it fully immutable because people always get into this pitfall where they have an immutable system, but I'll just change this. Then you're not immutable anymore, right? That's a problem because if you just change this and then the system reboots or it comes back in as new, that little thing is not there anymore, right? So no mm. matter what you did with it, you have to either be X or Y, right? Or have a very firm mm. way of doing those things, right? You have to have a system in place that will apply those settings to that thing, so mm. uh, and also you have two two sources of truth there. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, you, very careful. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think especially with app config and infrastructure config, the one thing, and luckily we're moving towards a world where that's a bit of it's handled a bit better because of uh, container orchestration. But if you think about it, there is some kind of infrastructure your app needs to run on. Then yeah. that infrastructure has got config. So it's firstly, the what is that infra? How is it configured? Yeah. Then it's the how is your App on top of that configured as well at that point in time, and then yeah. things move and versions move around all the time. Um, that also causes this problem, which is um, super interesting. And that's where I think this is one of those very strong it depends uh, yeah. scenarios. And my personal take is make it as much Im immutable as possible yeah. with a configuration management tool to allow you to change the things that you have to um, quickly and on the fly. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and there's a there's a comment by Todd Drag again. Uh, that um, by app config, I mean environment variables or options that okay. app or container need to be able to run. Uh, yeah, things like feature toggles, database, other endpoints, even secrets, or how to get them. Mm. Again, these things, I mean, of course, database connections, you, they're not dynamic most of the time, right? Especially in the serverless concept or, or containers, because 
you don't change them that often. And even if you change them often, you'll just spin up a new one. That's fine, right? Um, mm. But I, I would even argue for like environment variables. Um, like, like when people use the term environment variables, that's an application configuration item. It doesn't matter yeah. if you call it environment variable. It is something that's used by your application to do something. Mm. So, and of course, if we're talking serverless or Lambda functions, most of the time it doesn't matter because Lambda functions should execute in a matter of seconds and just go away. And if you're going to change the way your Lambda function works, you can, number one, change your infrastructure by updating those environment variables through your favorite tool, mm. infrastructure as code tool of choice, um, or by modifying your application code. Now, what is better? I would say neither. <laughs> I would really argue that neither is better because mm. um, especially on a complex system, um, managing configuration items, feature flags, toggles, even database connections should be kept away from those things. And now this is my humble opinion and I completely may be wrong. Uh, but like keeping them in a separate configuration management service or not even a service, it can be an S3 bucket with a JSON file. Yeah. Right. Um, keeping it there and parsing it during runtime is a far more flexible option than having to make a code change to your infrastructure or deploy infrastructure with a potential problem may happen um, yeah. to, to make a little flag toggle. And also how or restarting long... restarting that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And let's take let's take let's take the most extreme example in, into the in, into mind here the thing i talked about where it comes to like investigative logging or an incident has happened you need to enable verbose logging in your application if you deploy that through infrastructure configuration as a as an environment variable you're going to have a bad time because it takes no matter what you're using it takes a few minutes for it to deploy even mm -hmm. if it's a single thing um, it has to go through the pipeline it has to go through all the things a few minutes if you want to have it immediately done, you will basically make that change into app config, a JSON uh, object on S3, or even parameter store, right? And that would have you, that would give you the fastest way to your solution. And th in this case, you really need it immediately. Mm. And changing a database connection doesn't, it's not immediate. Most of, unless, uh, if, if changing a database connection is immediate, you have bigger problems. But uh, yeah. Mm, they're always around it, but I mean, we're not going to dig into that. But yes, I agree with um, if you have to. Um, but also, database connection changes are normally, normally like multi step ones because you can't just uh, take yeah. change the password because guess what? All the current connections will immediately drop. Exactly. Um, yeah, things that's, things why, I said, that's, what, that's why I said like changing database connections is a completely different mm -hmm. set of problems if you have to do it immediately. Uh, then your your database yeah. is, is hijacked, you move to a different one, and that's a that's a whole box of kittens then. So, yeah. mm. But I mean, also just, just digging into this environment variable config thing is to, remember, it's always that question of how near real time do you want your change yes. to kick in? Uh, because here, here's the challenge. Let's say I've got some static configuration that I load at app starter. And then when I make a change, what I need to do? I either need to tell the app, reconfigure yourself or restart. Now what, let's say you've got 10 copies of your app running. Guess what's going to happen when all 10 of them do this at the same time? Yeah. Exactly. A, you might have a well, whatever tool you've got for that value and things. So you need to think about this a little bit more smartly and figure out how do I handle the config management a little bit more on the fly, make them aware of it, um, pull things, maybe something. Um, there are various ways of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a very fair point. So and, and the first question you ask yourself when it comes to configuration management or application configuration management is like, how fast do I need this change yeah. to be applied when I talk about it? And, and also, who needs to do it? Because... Um, oh, yeah. We're developers. I always think I'm going to be making the change. Not necessarily. Um, let's say you have a business application or you have an application and all of a sudden your business development decides, I want to see how I want to see more data from this application in this week. And this week will enable, um, I want to see how many people from different types of world use it, whatever, right? They want more data from this application. Instead of coming to the development team and saying, hey, hey guys, can you enable this um, whatever for us? They can have an external process that will just enable that feature by updating a parameter somewhere, right? Or updating a configuration. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the developers or engineers who make these changes. And yeah. sometimes the business side that want to do this, want to be able to uh, toggle features on and, on and off. And also, not even that. Um, now, this is this is a maybe not a common use case, but um, tier toggles. 
So sometimes um, you can toggle specific things for specific users, and you can use also application configuration for those things, right? You can unlock specific features for specific users. Usually we do that through a database, uh, but sometimes there are some, some cases where you could, you could be able to do that. So uh, having the ability to update those things um, automatically or, or through an um, application approach would be also a, a good thing mm. instead of committing to code. Uh, hey, Joe yeah. Frickson. Hi. No, good, no. Mor good morning. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's um, the app config world is interesting. So if you think about a container, container lifecycle is a little bit different to normal app lifecycles in the sense yeah. that they're a little bit more transient. Um, we are very comfortable with uh, containers coming and going, um, extra ones being spun up and all that. Where with apps, especially if you look like a few years back, like let's say five, six, seven years back, that wasn't quite the norm yet. We weren't no. quite as comfortable. Apps were up and running for quite a uh, amount of time. And then it was a little bit more work to actually do these yeah. kind of changes. Um, and the big fun with it, well, this also comes in like, how do you version control your application and config changes? Because you want to know when things break and why they broke, not just, right. oh, someone quickly logged in by hand, clickety, clickety, there we go. Because then you're back to the old world where you've got unique Snowflake servers and yep. you won't have fun. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that's a very fair point. And, and, and today, we're, and especially when we're talking serverless, it's, 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 it's weird because if you have a Lambda function that runs for 15 minutes, you have a problem. You should not worry about those things, uh, but uh, still providing providing the ability to your application to grab that configuration in a in a very th meaningful way, and uh, uh, of course today we're shilling the service called App Config. Uh, so if you have not had a chance to look at App Config, right. App Config is basically that. It's a service, especially for Lambda functions. It I mean works anywhere, but it's a service that's uh, it serves as, serves as an API front end for your configuration items. So you define configuration items in a JSON mm. object. Yeah, but, but I think it's a little bit more because I think what I want it to is more. No, it, it is more. It is more. No, no. Position it, position it relative to parameter store and secrets manager, so we can understand the difference between those. Uh, so it is actually uh, it's built on it, it's built on top of parameter store, so it it can use parameter store as its source. So it can use both S three and parameter store as its data source. So it is in essence a front end to those things as like an API front end for those things. Front end, when I say I don't mean a web page, I mean like a front end, a place where you will query to get those things. Yeah. But it's just not that, not just that. It also does things like uh, manage those configurations properly. So it's it, it's able to deploy those configurations. So for example, let's say I decided all of a sudden that I'm gonna change my database endpoint, all right? So I can make that change in a configuration item but deploy it only to 10% of my uh, infrastructure. So only 10% of the queries I receive for that will receive um, the database endpoint. And app config knows because the, the, the application comes back to it with like its own ID and say, hey, this is me. And then it basically takes 10% of those things and gives them this uh, new endpoint. On top of that, it has verifications. It's able to verify for example, if you're using JSON, it will use JSON spec to see, have you actually formatted the JSON good? Does the value fit there? Is it a string? Is it an int? Whatever. Um, also, it, it, it can do like Lambda verification. You can attach Lambda functions to it to actually verify properly your configuration items. Are they good or not? So there's a lot of bells and whistles attached to it. So, And it's also very easy to roll back. If you break your configuration items, um, you can just roll roll back to the previous version of, of configuration and you know just reset everything as your as your application will start querying those things. And the way it works, I actually made a video completely on it uh, on my YouTube channel. I'm not going to show it, but it's just there. Uh, so how how does it actually work? It it it. It's not like a agent. It doesn't deploy configuration items to your applications or whatever. And that was my impression first time I heard about app, app config. I thought it was like oh, it's it's there's something sitting on your on your server that kind of copies the configuration items there. No no no, app config is literally an API that you use your application the database SDK whatever to query the API and says hey mm. hi this is me please give me configuration item number blah. And then it gives you this configuration item, and then that configuration item is just used by your application. So, yeah. Um, so just quickly, side note, because I do see we've got a couple of new people that joined in the last yeah. few minutes. Um, this is just a link that you can use to actually access all of our previous sessions. Um, yeah. So, and you can also watch the stream there as well if you were interested. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pop that in the chat quickly. Um, there we go. And just want to point out here, so if you are, because I see the majority of people actually coming in from the official AWS Twitch uh, channel, but yeah. also give us a follow on our own uh, Twitch channels, which you can see once I have this banner out the way. 
with banner. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, interface yeah. issues. There we go. So you can see our, as they point out, our, um, Twitch channels. So the reason for this is that we are moving towards this um, a period where we won't always be able to stream on the official AWS channel, yeah. but we'll continue with our things because, as you may not be aware, reInvent is coming, and reInvent is a little bit different this year given that it's virtual. Yeah. Um, and it's running for three weeks, starting at the end of November, I believe. Um, yeah. So that's going to be quite a busy period. And during that time, we will be doing many things for reInvent as well as our own streaming. So keep an eye on the various streams um, and give us a follow there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> our Waples is watching us on our own channel. Yeah, Waples, we have like a, the, the most people who watch us are on, on the official AWS Twitch channel because it's mm. the biggest one, I guess. Uh, we, we still both have like, like, 500 to 700 followers on our Twitch channels and, and YouTube, like just over 100. Mm. So it is, we cannot expect a massive audience there. So uh, we appreciate everybody coming to um, to the official Twitch channel, but also feel free to give us a follow on, on our channel. So if we, mm. if there's like a Monday, there's we're not available on the official AWS channel, uh, we're probably streaming on our own or something. Uh, yes. So yeah. uh, make sure to check out there. Plus we have additional content as well. So um, yeah, we do different things there. Yeah. Oh, Waples, I see. Congrats, you did hop from YouTube to Twitch. To Twitch um, yeah. So we can see that kind of inter <laughs> interesting info from our side. It's a uh, quite a bit of fun what we can see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let me quickly double check what we have over here. I think we've covered all the questions so far. But please, um, like Darko said at the start of today's session, please send questions our way, uh, our way yeah. comments, um, opinions, because the whole point is we want to make this as interactive as possible. Yeah. Um, we're happy to continue just talking. But I mean, um, I think as a um, uh, uh, on channels next week. What's happening next week? Nothing. No, no, no it's, it's still gonna remain the same, like how we're doing it right now. So, um, um, mm. uh, well, until further notice, that's the thing. Like, uh, usually yeah. when reInvent week comes in, it, the, the database channel is gonna be occupied by somebody else. I mean, somebody else, yeah. it means us. Uh, so if, if, with if, other if, people, yeah. with other people, yeah. If, if it happens that we cannot do our shows during that week, uh, on AWS channel, we can do it on our own. So just make sure that if yeah. you're following, follow us there as well. Um, so it would yeah. be easier. Let's just make it easier. Yeah. 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 So no, 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 we will still definitely still be uh, next week. Although this week is a special week about because of the dev day that's coming. Um, uh, yeah. speaking of, have we actually broadcasted what we want to do on the Friday? And yes, I'm putting it on the spot here. Remember our, our mega four hour thing. Oh, we have not. Uh, ooh, we Shall we that. announce it? Yes. Okay. Shall so we announce it? Yes. Aha. Go. Drum roll. Uh, I, I drum can't roll. do it. My noise cancelling. Sorry. Nah, noise yeah. cancelling. Okay, Kobus, announce yeah. the thing. So, as you heard at the start of this episode, and if you weren't here, we have got a, a modern application uh, development dev day coming, uh, yeah. which has got 12 interesting sessions. Now, as part of that is we want to be engaging with people. And so far, we've actually got a large amount of um, people registered for it. And yeah. our expectation is that we won't be able to handle all the questions during the sessions or even during the office hour session afterwards. So what we're going to do is on Friday, and we will still figure out the exact start times, but probably about 9 a.m. in the morning, yeah. um, is we will start and we will do a four-hour stream session here with myself and Darko, and we'll see who else is able to come join us. And we will be taking questions regarding that event and those cool. sessions. So. If you haven't registered for it yet and you've only joined us recently, here is a quick link for it so you can join. Like I said, it's um, 12 sessions focused specifically on how to develop modern applications, as we call them, event-driven things, using infrastructure as code. Um, all the fun stuff. Containers, serverless, all yeah, all the fun things. So come join us for that. But what that'll mean is for Friday, we won't have an, a bean streaming session like this, but we will be here for quite a uh, longer time frame, I believe. To put lightly, we will have the mega bean streaming session. Basically, mm. it's gonna be it's gonna be us and hopefully some other people. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be answering the questions that we potentially got the day before. So because here's the thing, mm. um, on on Thursday the the fifteenth of October, we are having the official Q and A throughout the event. Now it's all going through the webinar platform. It's a bit different than just this, um, and there's potential limits there, right? So. Um, yeah. If you're unable to join the Q&A during that time, or you would like just your general Q&A on the day after, we're going to do like a big old mega stream, like a full on morning, yeah. 9am to, to whatever, uh, whatever time we can grab. Mm. Um, and we're happy to, to talk about the questions and, and feel free to join us, invite your friends, invite your family uh, to come here and ask us technical questions on, on the dev day. Uh, so those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quickly, Joe, to answer your question around does reinvent, is reinvent on Twitch? Um, Yes, with a couple of 
interesting caveats to it. There are some shows planned for that period, but also um, we typically at reInvent have a thing called Launchpad, which we do live stream in any case. As new services come out, we talk about them, show people how to use them, those kind of things. And both Dark and myself are involved with Launchpad this year. Yeah. So we will have specific Launchpad sessions for specific releases, but not just us. There's a whole massive lineup. I think we're 30, 40 people that will be yeah. streaming during that period. Um, I think we stream, I think, three days a week, something like that for the full three weeks or four weeks of reInvent. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be busy and we're also doing different time zones we're working with um, people from apjc so the pacific uh, asia pacific area then yeah. we've got our emea time zone, and then we've got our america latam time zone etc so it's going to be it's going to be interesting and there's a very high probability that we won't have slots on this channel available to us at that point yeah exactly but mm. this this friday do join us for this mega stream uh, where we're going to be doing a whole lot of things on on on, on the on the topic of the dev day so Number one, do join us on the Dev Day on on Thursday. Uh, and if you uh, mm -hmm. have, if you have if you were failed to uh, approach to us during the Q and A session there, uh, do join us on on Friday. We're gonna be here mm -hmm. for for all of you. Um, well, for a longer time, hopefully. Uh, oh yes. <laughs> to discuss things as well. So it's it's mm -hmm. gonna be a bit of a different approach, and it's gonna yeah. be a bit more earlier. Oh yeah, but I mean, um, getting back to the configuration manager discussion that we have is, uh, Darko, what is your history in terms of where did you start with, where did you go and why did you change away from something? Uh, so where did I start? Well, I, I mean, I basically started with doing, doing batch scripts, not bash, batch for Windows. So I did like all Thought the- bat. That bat, yeah. But that's what, that was how I started. And it was uh, mm -hmm. some batch and some visual basic, not visual basic, uh, VB script. VB script, Visual Basic mm. script, yes. The horrible yeah. thing that's VB script. Uh, I hated it. I I was uh, I was I, I was bad at it. That's one thing. But uh, I really didn't enjoy doing VB script. Mm. Uh, then my first proper proper configuration management on Windows was with PowerShell. Uh, no DSC back then, just pure PowerShell. But it was much more flexible than any language back then on Windows, bar installing something completely separate. So mm. uh, it was really cool for me. Um, from then on, I basically started, I mean, again, I mentioned group policy objects or GPOs or Active Directory type of configuration items on Windows. That worked. Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was not the best of things to work in because the, my, my problem with GPOs is like, it, you guess it's going to do that. You don't really know what's going to do it. It's, it's like, it says, mm. oh, this configures, and it's very vague, like, oh, this thing configures whatever. And like, Okay, um, I hope that is the case. Mm. Um, and if I wanted to do something more advanced on Windows, because everything on Windows is a registry key, so then I would manually, um, yeah. manually or automatically change registry keys with, with scripts. Um, but again, that was a problem because uh, I would have to include a lot of verification in my scripts, as we, as we said. Like uh, either both it wasn't the thing with scripting, so this is where the problem was. Um, then. After I after my Darko configuration management system, um, I moved on to Chef, and that was actually within AWS. That's when I moved to AWS. That's when I found oh, okay. out about Chef. Uh, I've didn't use Chef before, so I'm relatively a novice Chef user when it comes to age. Like I have only maybe five years of experience, less than that. Um, and I've seen that Chef is so powerful. When I saw it, like, oh, you can just write these things, and they will configure things. Mm -hmm. So really good, really good. Um, and I mean, yeah. the service on AWS that kind of helped me introduce me to Chef was uh, AWS OpsWorks. So OpsWorks is, um, well, there's there's two flavors, three flavors of OpsWorks, actually. There's OpsWorks Stacks, the OG OpsWorks, where they used Chef to actually configure EC2 instances. But it was in a very, very weird way. Uh, okay, not weird, but... Um, it would do it their own way. They would have like uh, specific layers and then those layers have specific cookbooks, uh, basically run lists mm. configured and blah, blah, blah. And they would just execute these cookbooks uh, uh, as, as the instances come up. But there's also Chef Automate. Or basically, it's a, it's a fully managed Chef Automate server on AWS. And there's also Puppet Enterprise. So that's basically where my most Puppet and my Chef experience comes from. So yeah. Mm. Okay, we've got a question here quickly before we jump into my mm -hmm. um, um, history in terms of our internet things, which is when you dynamically pull the config from central service like app config, can you still maintain compatibility with various builds versions of the app itself? With too much work to maintain both forwards, backwards compatibility. Yes, so yeah. I've actually dealt with this in quite a bit of detail. So when you get to this point where, and this is often around the, we want to be able to change configuration values for a specific version of the yeah. app. So when 1.7 rolls out, have this config ready. 
Now, one way that I did it in the past was in a config file that was inside the actual code base, which is technically not something you necessarily want because that means that it overrides whatever you have. But you can set up a cascading preferences in terms of the different configs that you have. Okay. So, for example, you can set it up to say the base config for the app is set logging level to info. Okay. But then what you can do is you can have multiple other overrides. So let's say, for example, this one specific service. On a service level, you can configure an override config or okay. on a service slash version level. And what you do there is that that's the ascending order of priority. So the more specific you get, the higher priority that config value has. Because what that allows you to do, for example, is let's say when I roll out version 1.8, I know I need to change from uh, one, uh, let's say, database um, driver to new database version driver, something weird like that, where because it's on that specific version, as soon as that version comes up, it grabs all the other configs, keeps on overwriting, overwriting till it hits this last point of version 1.8 says, I need DB driver 1.3.721. And now I'm at that thing. And that also allows then the second part of the question, which is how you maintain backward and forward compatibility. It does ever introduce some interesting considerations because let's say now for 1.8, I'm testing this new version, but I haven't set that on the base one level up for my specific service or globally for an environment. Then you might miss that config. So config management is always difficult and you have to remember that kind of thing. Um, when you're running with it, so that if otherwise next version we deploy, you're going to revert back to two configs back because it's no longer on the specific version. Um, and yes, there are definitely things that I'm not sure app config if app config can directly um, convert into a, if a Kubernetes config map. But I mean, if you're using app config, you should be able to use the SDK to integrate it directly into your application, which means you don't need the config maps in Kubernetes. So. Give me a second. Let me let me try to show this to you. I have a, I have an example of, of app config running on a, on a, an application. Mm. Share. Let me application window. I think this is the one. Yeah. Okay. So um, here, here's a, here's an example of how does this look inside of my um, my uh, lambda function. So this is a super simple lambda function. Just spits out some random quotes. Uh, but this is the, the app config part of it, right? So basically, you request um, a specific configuration for a specific application for a specific environment and what configuration item you want. Now, um, you can have different environments, you can have different type names or configurations, but basically what you get is like a JSON object, which you later on uh, is just, I'm, I'm basically having it as here as a, as a return items, then I just take like um, values from those things. And this is where you can you can you can jumble with uh, with specific versions you wish to use or not, right? This is how this is how it would work. Um, it, it cannot directly load things into Kubernetes. Again, App config is not a push method. So if something can query app config, if something can basically run this API call to app config, that would work, right? Uh, otherwise it just, just doesn't, right? So uh, you have you would have to have a system to invoke or request configuration mm. items, and, and that's how you do it, right? So if you have like a staging environment, you would define a specific different, different environment here, and app config would give you a different set of parameters or different set of configuration items. Um, for those things. That's how it will work. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention here is that, yeah, there was an example by my colleague, Chris, uh, Richard Boyd. He actually used app config to load the entire Lambda function. So he <laughs> had just this in his Lambda function oh. and his code was in, in, in app config. You can do that, <laughs> which yeah. you shouldn't. But <laughs> I've, I, I've, I've used an example before. I worked at a company where we actually um, persisted compiled Java classes into um, a SQL <laughs> database just to allow us to hot load code and change I the guess. server the way it performed and did things depending on what uh, we wanted to do on the fly as it was running, yeah. um, which there was a reason for it, a very good reason, but it was like, wow, that feels dangerous. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's 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 not not the best way to do it. But yeah, this is basically how app config works now. With Lambda extensions, it would be different because in Lambda extensions now you can actually um, invoke all of this before the execution of mm -hmm. the Lambda function and have it all baked in. So it's it's a it's a much faster way to do it. But Lambda fun Lambda extensions are currently in preview, so um, it will take a mm -hmm. month or so for it to yeah, if, to, if, to join. If you did miss that announcement last week, please go look. It's one of the biggest yeah. Lambda-related announcements in the last while. It's We spoke a bit about it on Friday's session, um, yeah. but it is it is insanely good. So, yeah. cool. Cool. Uh, so, let's what, answer what Wapples. Uh, Wapples asks, yes. uh, what time are you, what are you, well, just first thing, what time are you starting on Friday? Um, most likely 9 a.m. I'm not sure. We still haven't yes. confirmed, yeah. but uh, we'll tweet about it. 
Oh, so, we don't have daylight savings change over yet, so I don't have to be confused. Have it at all. Okay. Mm. What what is your daylight saving? We don't. You don't have the. Oh, okay. Which is why I get confused. Wait, yes. wait. I, I'm not sure when is when is mine. Uh, DSD. I think yours is one November. I think something like that. Yeah, but in any case, um, if you're curious, uh, Wapples, uh, then the, for, for the second question, so we'll likely start at nine. Like I said, there's one caveat. We just need to double check that we're not stealing someone else's session slot, but 99% certain that it's open. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll start at nine and we'll finish at what? Which means I will bring, I don't know how many coffees and teas and I might actually just, I should get a percolator up and running so I can actually make coffee all way through here in the office. There I've got go. a percolator still somewhere. I'll, I'll sort that out. Um, <laughs> Uh, we can okay, have different so types of coffee. We we move we move time zones on October twenty fifth. So uh, October twenty fifth. Okay, not. Uh, that are savings times. Okay, that I must remember because yeah. isn't the US then on the first of November, which means there's going to be a very there, there, there's, there's there's like a week yeah. gap between us or something like mm. that. It's, it's, it's going to be Speaking a mess. of, this is a nice anecdote. I think we spoke about it on Friday. Why the Twitch schedule was um, broken last week or incorrect last week. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Do, do, yeah. So for those who weren't here, basically what happened is we um, we saw that Monday was scheduled correctly, but then from Tuesday onwards, some of the sessions were out by one hour. And okay. Europe didn't change data savings. US didn't change, change data savings. So why did the sessions move? And it ended up being the person who scheduled them is based in Australia, in Sydney. They, on 6 October, which is last week, Tuesday, changed. And because they had initiated the writing of those entries at times, it moved them relative to their time zone, which is like... This is the wow. first time I've seen something like that happen, which is <laughs> interesting. So wow. there may be some weirdness at the end of the month, pre-warning people if you look at the AWS schedule. Um, and if you haven't actually seen that, you can go to, uh, let me get you the URL. You can actually see what's coming up in terms of the Twitch shows. Yeah. So D DSD I, I, is a problem. DSD is, is a problem, especially if you work across the globe. Like I didn't even yeah. imagine how big of a problem it could be before I kind of start, mo start working with my... Uh, with my uh, colleagues from the US and Australia, it's just like, mm. it's a pain. There you go. Yeah. So sorry, they are just pasted it. Um, yeah, so obviously in South Africa, well, not obviously for those who don't, don't know, uh, we don't do daylight savings change. Yeah. Um, we actually, with the distance between Cape Town and Joburg, which is, I think, diagonally is about 1,600 kilometers. In theory, we could do two time zones um, yeah. out by one hour. But then we always make the joke saying, like, then we'll have three times in terms of figuring out when people pitch up, which will be Cape Town time, Joburg time, and Africa time. Because in general, <laughs> we're not that precise on time when we, it's like, yeah. <laughs> now versus now, now versus just now, and all those fun things. If you have not read up on that, go search for South African meaning of now, 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 and just now. It, okay. uh, it is guaranteed to provide you with some entertainment. <laughs> well, the European Union was supposed to... Uh... Give up on on DST uh, this week this year, but uh, due to the COVID situation, they have delayed that decision for. Yeah, I was about to say. I think it's a little bit busy this year. This year, it's year's, a little bit um, busy. Yeah, so yeah. I think I hopefully in the next couple of years we're gonna completely just give up on on DST. So um, mm. so that's uh, that is that is that is pretty cool. <laughs> Looking forward for that because uh, the constant switching is just complicated. Uh, it just messes people up. It's just I mean it's mm. it's a first world problem. I get it, but uh, it's a. Uh, we don't need DST anymore. Like there is mm. no, especially not. I mean, in the modern world of electricity and and DST or daylight saving time, literally doesn't contribute to anything. There's no more candles that we need to light and mm. and waste. And oh, it's it's fine. So I have to quickly bring this up, which is completely off uh, off topic. But let me just quickly add this to the stream because so a little bit of background. <laughs> Um, the way we project things with maps and with globes, because the Earth is not just, it's not round, it's actually squished yep. round. Um, the way we project them, people seem to think that when you look at Europe, you look at Africa. So let's quickly say, um, oh wait, wrong, wrong screen. Uh, if you go to, let's just say maps. Um, yeah, we, use a, we, use a, we use the Merc Merc Mercator, Merc Mercator projection, yes. projection which, is, uh, which is bad. Yeah. See. So if you look at this, so for example, over here, you can see the U.S. is quite big. Take Canada, and, and if you eyeball it, you would say yeah. that U.S. and Canada is bigger than Africa together, right? Well, no, because of the, yeah. that, that curving at the top. So if you actually look at this, yeah. here you go, and if you take Africa, you can see what you can squish in there if, if you literally scale it according to the area size. So yeah. just quickly, it is huge. Yeah, yeah. Also, Japan is huge. Like I'm always surprised how, how mm -hmm. big Japan is. Like Japan seems yeah. like, oh, it's just a bunch, a bunch of islands. Buddy, it's massive. <laughs> Japan yeah. is huge. So yeah, yeah. Um 
no, I mean, uh, Africa is massive. I mean, especially, mm-hmm. like, I mean, Kobus can th- give you this for uh, like firsthand uh, because when whenever he has to fly somewhere, it's like a thousand kilometers <laughs> at least. No, 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 no. It's, it's yeah, I mean, more. It's um, more. So for okay. me, my closest, closest flight is if I go to here at the bottom here, which, which is Port Elizabeth. That's like a short okay. flight, which is 45 minutes for me. If I fly up to Durban, that's an hour and a bit, which is roughly yeah. about here. Joburg is two hours. Um, yeah. And then yeah. we start getting to when I go visit uh, Darko in Europe for events. Um, it's 12 hours, flying straight right. up to Amsterdam is, I think, 11 and a half. Frankfurt is 11 and a half. It's, yeah. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. No, no, no. I mean, you know, in Europe, you can get anywhere in two and a half hours. Literally any place in Europe you can fly, especially from Germany. You can fly in any mm. place in two and a half hours uh, at most. Like, I think, like, for me, Madrid is like, or, or Athens is a long way because it's two hours away. So, yeah, I was <laughs> laughed at uh, the Europeans complaining about how long their flights were. They had to sit for two hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I'm when like, I fly, buddy, buddy, when, please. I fly, when I have to fly to Athens, it's like, oh, two hours. I have to be in a plane for two hours. Jesus. Because, like, I'm used to like flying to Munich and it's like 35 minutes <laughs> or Frankfurt. It's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's, yeah. Fly, flying was interesting last year. It Let's was. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but this year cool. no flying uh yay yeah so get, let's let's get back to our topic I, it, it's interesting i've been keeping an eye on the number of people we have on the stream and it varies by up 10 or 20 people depending on what we're talking about so i'm very curious to see if people are joining rejoining um if they are more interested in the random conversations so quick poll for those that are here yeah. let us know if you like the random segues into even non-tech things or you prefer us to stick to tech or if you want to suggest stick to the topic at hand we uh, really want to figure out what people like and what they want us to yeah. talk about um otherwise we will continue rambling and doing random things yeah because we are here for you right that's the thing so we are mm. here to kind of help and educate and talk about things that are important to you so um yeah let us know so that's yeah so speaking conflict management again um my one was quite interesting. I went through, um, well, bash scripts, and um, I had a couple of batch scripts as well. But generally, my Windows stuff wasn't more clicky and manual config than it was um, no. as much scripting, scripting on Windows. I just, for some reason, I kind of just just missed the PowerShell world. I did a bit of it, but not enough. Um, then I played with Puppet, and obviously, Eyes went open, and Puppet was awesome. Then I had some issues with it because of that way that it's ran multiple times and then only gets the uh, eventual consistent desired state type scenario, okay. which which was a bit weird. And then I went on to Ansible, loved Ansible for a while until I started hitting the undefined variable situation, which was very frustrating. Now, granted, I use Ansible not just for config management, but also infrastructure creation, which okay. at that point, it, was, it felt like it was being shoehorned in a little bit. Um, at, fix some of the uh, modules and things yeah. for my own use. Um, but I think got to a point where I realized that that's not the right tool for what I'm trying to do. And then ultimately got into Chef and then, you know, just fell in love with Chef and went completely overboard. But uh, I even still have some Chef scripts running here on my local machine, which is awesome. Um, uh, I actually I, haven't looked at it for a while, but yeah. I must say that um, that uh, that using Ansible for me was like great for affli- uh, for infrastructure, conf- sorry, sorry, for configuration management, for server configuration management, especially when you would do things like with Vagrant or something like that, just great, because it mm. can apply Ansible playbooks immediately. But doing things in like uh, infrastructure provisioning was just bad because it was not tracking state. It like, yeah. I would execute an Ansible playbook to l- launch an EC2 instance, it would launch it as many times as it would launch it. So oh, it's, yeah. It's it's not the best thing in the world from that perspective, um, but it's it's a really uh, I think it's a it's a very approachable tool for uh, configuration mm. management because it's easy to get into. Uh, uh, playbooks are very straightforward what they do. Uh, they don't require any language knowledge at all. It's a very YAML like thing. So it is YAML, I think, completely. Yeah, it's YAML. So mm. it is. It is. It yeah, is, yeah, that part yeah, at least. YAML, yeah. yeah. And Wapple says that that's why they move from Ansible to SaltStack. Um, yeah, I've never hmm. used SaltStack. Then, in your question about if AWS is going to bring SaltStack in, uh, is SaltStack like a serverless? Oh, sorry, oh, oh god, that's mm. a bad term. Uh, it's a Salt- it's a thing without it's a without a management server, right? It's it's basically. Uh, uh no 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 no! You've got Salt pillars. Um, okay. And um, yeah, you've got so Salt is more similar towards um, like 
a chef and puppetware has got an agent running on the host. Um, okay. But if I remember my detail correctly, it uses uh, zero MQ to actually handle the comms between them. So first, it's very quick. It doesn't actually use um, SSH to communicate back to the main okay. server. Um, and it's almost like a blend, if I remember correctly now, please correct me, people, uh, between Chef and Ansible in the sense that it's Python-based, but it's got the agent and just the way it works is okay. similar in terms of the syntax and the templating that it uses, similar to Ansible. Um, but it does, I think, keep track of the state a bit better. Right. Um, but I haven't well, worked with it. Well, I mean, then, then the answer to this question, uh, Waffles, is... Uh, whenever people would ask for it enough. <laughs> That's the thing. Like we build our yeah. services and the features we have depending on the customer ask. So if, if we get a lot of customers asking, hey, can you build OpsWorks to support SaltStack? Yeah. So it... That's why we we don't make decisions by banging our stomachs. We basically ask customers and get your feedback. So uh, that's why it's very important that if you if you have an idea, if you have a a wish, a requirement, whatever, either reach out to database support or reach out to your account manager, solution architect, if you're working mm -hmm. with one. Um, tell them, hey, can you please submit this feature request for me, or tell us, right? And we will get yeah. those things to to the right place because. Uh, that's how we and everybody else should be working with uh, their applications because you own the development of it, you own the interaction with your customers, and you want to make sure to get the proper um, um, proper uh, input into place. So yeah, mm. yeah, that's, definitely. That's a big and also, just remember, we, we've got a big internal system um, where we actually track all of these requests. So the more people ask for something, the higher um, it'll become in the priority list. Yeah. So always, please go ask. Yeah, exactly. So that's very important. <laughs> cool. So now, let's let's move on to why and uh, configuration management doesn't matter as much anymore when we start looking at containers and how the world has shifted. Because yeah. that's one of the big things that I dealt with is directly having taken companies from pre-container into single container per service into container orchestration um, things in the past. And uh, server config becomes very interesting with uh, container orchestration. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. I, I would I would say that my my experiences with server configuration management uh, with containers was that you, uh, especially on the on, on the places where you actually have like a cluster of EC2 instances that are running behind ECS, um, the problem with those instances is that that it is uh, potentially very destructive if you remove one, because you're not just tearing down one application or one service. You can potentially remove a bunch of services from the same host. So yeah. sometimes when things need to be added, when things need to be configured, uh, instead of rebuilding that thing, uh, applying configuration is a great thing. You're not going to apply configuration to the container itself. At least that's not my experience. You would apply configuration to the container host. Um, mm. And this a lot of times boils down to things like um, um, running security stuff because that's very important. Um, There's no ways. Exactly. <laughs> there's still an operating system under there, even though you're 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 running on containers. There's still a server mm. underneath that needs to be maintained and needs to be patched and needs to be those things. So, mm. yeah, it's it's one of those interesting things is when when you start dealing with orchestration, we run multiple containers on the same host. Um, scaling up is usually the easier one to deal with because there's a new host coming up. It's got capacity, and we start spinning up services there. Yeah. But the actually scaling down is a lot more difficult because a You've got services running on that instance that you have yeah. to move somewhere else. And B, you might not have capacity, yeah. which is a very interesting scenario to get into. Is like, what happens when we scale down because we need to replace this instance yeah. for whatever reason and we can't run, we don't have capacity for our extra containers? What happens? I mean, is first come, first serve? Do we first spin up a new one? So yeah. always, when you're playing with this and you uh, go figure out what your scaling down strategy is first because it's the most complex. Scaling up usually point. is easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we never thought about that, like scaling down a problem. Mm -hmm. Scaling down is a problem when we talk about containers, especially if you want to do like uh, recycle an instance or something like that, because oh yeah, you may need to scale up before you scale down. So yeah, no, it's interesting, and that's why uh, when a lot of people when we talk about the advantage of using something like AWS Fargate, where it's a yeah. you specify the container you want to run, but you don't have to worry about the host or capacity. So you yeah. just say CPU, memory, list of containers, boom, go, and it yeah. just spins it up somewhere, similar to AWS Lambda functions. That's Correct. why that is so popular and that helps people is that you don't have to do capacity management. Um, serverless containers. It's serverless containers, basically. So. <laughs> yeah. And yes, yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that's useful. But I mean, if you think about it, for an operating system to be able to run containers, you tend to need to have Docker, 
or if you're in some kind of other container um, uh, orchestrator um, on the actual host itself to do things. Um, and then yep. in there might be some other agent that connects to things. So let's say if it's well, ECS, have, is the, but you have yeah, like the also ECS. other things, ECS and like maybe a Datadog agent, maybe Qualys, maybe something internal to your systems. Yes, the, the daemon sets. Daemons, yeah. All, all of those things need to run on your systems. Of course, you can spin them up during the install. That's fine. But, you know, hey, uh, permissions mm -hmm. to the server, maybe you have an external system that doing that. That's fine. But still, yeah. there are some cases where you don't have that. Or you need to install specific packages and then uh, uh, an additional package. So, for example, what happens if you all of a sudden need to run package A on all systems. Yeah. Do you recycle it all? Do you schedule downtime? Or do you have a configuration management system in place that will just magically <laughs> install those things on your systems? So yeah. And this then is where if you're wondering, exists. And if you're wondering uh, what the situation is in terms of which one should you pick of those, it's this classic answer where we're going to go like, yeah. you know, throw the it yeah. depends out there. Because some people will go, well, I'm not in a rush. So if I need to spin up a whole new fleet, um, with a new config, I click yeah. a button, it goes out half an hour to an hour later, we're there, that's fine. Other people go like, no, 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 this is super critical, it's a CVE, we have to get it out right now, run it, yeah. go. Um, yeah. So yeah. Fully agree, fully agree so with that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of options, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, okay, question, yeah. out, of the, out of the blue, Rulix World, hello, welcome back. Um, it was recently announced the oh. form images. Are they coming to Lightsail, Fargate? I didn't have a chance to test the performance, but AWS claims they are faster and cheaper. Oh my God, I need to I need to share something. Oh, yes. Uh, have the you one from the... Honeycomb. Yeah, from Liz. Uh, oh yeah. God, I love it. Uh, so Liz, Liz, uh, Liz Fong, she is a developer advocate at Honeycomb, honeycomb.io, and they did this really great blog post on how cool arm is i'll post the link in the thing here um but so to answer the question when are they coming to uh, Lightsail and uh, um and fargate i don't know like really don't know especially when it comes to fargate i, I can imagine mm. it coming to Lightsail sooner than fargate um but when it comes to um it using it they are definitely like in this example that liz used and liz actually interesting enough they use chef if you have read the article, they actually use Chef mm. to configure their EC2 instances. So uh, they have an application running in Golang. And this application, um, basically what they needed to do is they run Kafka and they run this application written in Golang. And um, the the only thing they need to do for migration is basically recompile their application with an ARM64 flag. Oh, yeah. And that's it. It works. Uh, and basically, they, they could... Uh, the, 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 the end effect of, of this migration was that they, they were able to cut down on. Uh, let me actually share this little graph they have yeah. here. Uh, I'm so find it as well. Oh, there we go. I, I got it. it. You got Boom. it. Yeah, it's on screen. There we go. Okay, there we go. So uh, basically, this is the amount of instances they're running or the cost. So what happened mm -hmm. is here they were able to reduce the number of instances uh, by thirty percent by moving from C5 to M6 uh, yes. and C6, right? So they moved from C5 to, uh, to, C, uh, to C6G and M6G, basically using the mm. Graviton instances. The same size, they need just less of them because they're more efficient. And on top of that, they're cheaper uh, because yeah. I think like up to 20 or 40% cheaper because uh, Gravitons are our, our CPUs. So uh, mm. um, oh, well, Graviton, yeah. yeah. Well, Graviton 1 was uh, more focused, like, or, or the first A1 instances were more focused on, like, running generic uh, low-intensity compute workloads. Uh, Graviton 2 are much more powerful. I think they're the most mm. powerful uh, ARM-based chip you can get on, on, on a cloud. So, um, yeah. it is worth a shot, right? And... Uh, my colleague Boaz, or our colleague Boaz, is actually like he was asking us once on on one of the uh, streams, like, "Hey, would you think it would be difficult to create a LAMP stack on, on ARM?" <laughs> it took him five minutes <laughs> because all of those uh, things you need for LAMP are are already available. Uh, so, uh, what is it? Uh, what's LAMP? Linux, Apache, PHP, and MySQL are all Much available yeah. for um mm. uh, for uh, ARM. And again. Even if some things, especially when it comes to open source software, even if it's not available for ARM as a binary, you can always compile it to run an ARM. Mm. So, uh, I, th I think this is great. I am a big fan of, of ARM. I'm a big fan of having a you know third player in the game. Um, so it it is it is good. Mm. And and I mean the end of the, the end story of this, it's cheaper. It's cheaper for you. Yeah. All. So, you know, 
But I mean, also, this story ties in very nicely with our topic today, which is what you can see is, uh, let me actually get my cursor there, is over there, you can see they started playing a little bit with some of the ARM instances, and then the next one, you've got a bigger chunk, yeah. and then all of a sudden a big chunk, which means that they definitely have configuration management in place, where they can just swap things out and start changing the infrastructure, and then uh, the config just kicks in, um, which shit. is a... They have shit. Yes. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So uh, yeah, and you can see here that even big companies such as Honeycomb, uh, they still use configuration management. And mm -hmm. yeah, even us, we internally use configuration management, or we use uh, some configuration man management tools internally to configure something. So I believe at one point, like like Facebook was running a lot of things on Chef, and yeah, so, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know what if that's the case anymore, but yeah, I don't know. But yeah. yeah. Here's hoping to more ARM. Here's hoping to more uh, Graviton too. And now you can run. Uh, oh, actually, since the new Graviton news as well. Um, since last week, you can run Elastic Cache on Graviton. So cheaper. So you can run yeah. Elastic Cache clusters on Graviton too. So you can do M6G and R6G as well. So now you can run basically your databases, your caches, your application servers. Um, not sure what else. Not your containers though, yeah, still. Okay. Well, you can through. Can you do? Yeah, you can. You can do ECS on Graviton. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I think so. Well, the the agent itself is available for ARM architecture, okay. but I don't know yeah. if we if, if you can do Fargate or Lightcell on Graviton yet. Fargate? Um, no, it's... I would say Fargate. No, um, or, or Lightcell. But when is it coming? Those yeah. things we we unfortunately do not know. <laughs> but it would be cool to, yeah. to have definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I must actually take a look. So if you're not aware, the the Fog Containers Roadmap of AWS is actually on GitHub. So you can yeah. go look at what people are working on and what the priority is. Um, we started open sourcing a lot of, Yeah, we started open sourcing a lot of those roadmaps. So you have the roadmap for containers, you have the roadmap for cloud formation as well, uh, CDK, absolutely. Um, all those roadmaps are publicly available. Um, and to be honest, a lot of times that's all we know. <laughs> Even us, we don't have... We don't have magic access to this magic vault with like, you know, EC3 or whatever is coming out and uh, whatever. Uh, so we don't know those things. <laughs> we wish we did, yeah. but uh, no. Yeah, no, no, it's quite amusing how what we know and don't know. And often it's <laughs> less than people seem to think like, yes, we're inside AWS, but no, we don't have access to the secret documents. <laughs> or oh, yeah. we might have, we just don't know where they are. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But it's but it's really cool. uh, two pizza teams. They are fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, yeah. it, especially in AWS, the way you get like us internally, the way we get answers to like upcoming features or services is by asking. So you have to ask the right person. Like, hey, can mm. you share some information about that, so I can be yeah. ready? And sometimes they will share it with you. Uh, a lot of times they won't. The the problem is like it's not just that it's a big secret. It's a you. I cannot tell you. Hey, uh, service. Monkey brain is coming out because I don't know if it is and I don't know when it's going to come out because it's just software development, right? <laughs> There's rarely a very fixed deadline to things or yeah, it's easily broken. Let's call it that way. Yes. I mean, feature slip, new exascope creep, additional, it didn't work the way we thought it was going to work. <laughs> I, I depend on another service. Yeah, that, that's one of the main reasons we don't, don't advertise the dates for when things are coming out because we found that they tend to move the whole time. And instead of trying to pre-plan everything, we'd rather say, listen, let's build and focus on the most important tasks at hand and get them done. Yeah. And then when it's ready, it's ready. Um, Speaking so. of deadlines, um, we have a deadline coming up. <laughs> uh, Ooh. End, end of our stream is coming up. So uh -huh. let's slowly wrap this up. Uh, yeah, in a minute and a half. So... Um, just to kind of recap what we talked about today. So today yes. it was a talk, topic was configuration management. So we talked about the, how our configuration management journeys from uh, writing lovely little scripts to doing some uh, potentially weird automation things with with complicated stuff um, to to actually using a proper configuration management system such as Chef, Puppet, or uh, SaltStack, Ansible, mm -hmm. whatever one of those. We discussed why is it important, uh, why still it makes sense in 2020 because still there are EC2 instances. Even if you're running containers, there are EC2 instances underneath them, and you want to be able to dynamically change those things. Uh, on top of that, we talked about application configuration management with tools such as AppConfig that can help you uh, distribute your application configurations dynamically mm. through an API. And uh, yeah, we touched upon a, a few different things. We talked about daylight saving time. We talked about Graviton 2 instances. And... 
Hubbing uh, Africa's. Hubbing Africa's. <laughs> so, welcome to Fun Times with Cobus and Darko. Um, uh, so, <laughs> we talk about weird things. It could be another show. Yeah, I'm exactly. Random on <laughs> but yeah, thank you everybody, everybody for joining mm -hmm. us. Um, and uh, I apologize for me dropping out initially because no, of no. my broken internet. Cobus is always here to help out. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so... Oh yeah, Thursday, fifteenth of yes. October. Dev day quickly coming up. Up, screen once up, up, again. up yeah. There we go. Oh, final we're, reminder we're, for we're, everyone. <laughs> we're trying to shield this thing, so make yes. sure to register. We're gonna be there. Uh, both of us are giving talks as well. Make sure to join us. Um, there's a live Q and A afterwards. And if you cannot make the live Q and A this Friday, most likely early in the morning, nine a.m. Um, we're both gonna be here for a mega stream, trying to uh, mm. number one ask answer your question. Number two get the questions from yesterday and kind of regurgitate mm. them. So if you want to follow up or something like that, because um, yeah. we always have to count on people not asking questions all the time. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And with that, I think we are done for today. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kobus. Thank you all. Bye.